Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2021 Lundbeck Foundation Brain Prize. This year from the Planetarium Dome in Copenhagen, where I, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, feel a little lonely without all of you. We have an exciting program for this year's celebration of outstanding discoveries in brain science. We are going to meet the winners and the chairman of the selection committee. And we will, hopefully, get new insights into a very special field of pioneering science. The Brain Prize is the world's largest award for brain science. And it is all about the people who dare. The people who dare to follow an idea, dare to persist. We would, of course, have preferred to celebrate them in person, but we have tried to bring them as close to you as technically possible. But first, I would like to introduce CEO of the Lundbeck Foundation, Lene Skole. A warm welcome to the announcement of the 2021 winners of the Brain Prize. For more than 10 years, the Brain Prize has recognized scientists who have made groundbreaking contributions to global neuroscience. For me personally, and for the Lundbeck Foundation as a whole, the announcement of the Brain Prize winners is the highlight of the year. Today is the 4th of March, which is also the date on which the Lundbeck Foundation was founded. 67 years ago, Grete Lundbeck, the widow of the founder of H. Lundbeck, established the foundation. And today, it's one of the largest commercial foundations in Denmark. Our aim is to improve lives by investing responsibly with a long-term perspective in healthcare companies and in public research with a special focus on neuroscience. And the Brain Prize highlights our devotion to the brain. We fund the brightest minds to tackle one of the world's greatest scientific challenges, understanding and treating disorders of the brain. Brain diseases impose an enormous and growing burden on patients, their relatives, and society as a whole. Enabling new discoveries and bringing those discoveries to lives is the very essence of our purpose. The Brain Prize is our opportunity to acknowledge the brilliant minds that have pushed the frontiers of neuroscience and paved the way for improving brain health. Today, we are honoring four brilliant researchers who have dedicated their entire career to understanding the causes of one of the world's most common diseases of the brain. Together, they have accomplished what must have seemed impossible when they first embarked on their scientific journey. Their perseverance and talent have transformed an idea that emerged more than 40 years ago into novel treatments that will change the lives of millions and millions of patients across the world. We consider it an honor and our privilege to award them with the Brain Prize 2021. Now it's time for what we have all been waiting for. Exactly, Lena. The Brain Prize 2021 goes to a team of four professors from four different countries for their pioneering work on migraine. Between the many qualified nominations from all over the world, the selection committee chose to award the Brain Prize 2021 to Professor Lars Edvinson, Professor Peter Goadsby, Professor Michael Moskowitz, and Professor Jess Olesen. Congratulations to all of you. And to help describe the motivation for awarding the Brain Prize to these four scientists, a very warm welcome to Professor Richard Morris, Chairman of the Brain Prize Selection Committee and recipient of the Brain Prize 2016. Hello, Professor Morris. I'm sure everyone would like to start with the Selection Committee's motivation. Thank you, Lena. Um, I'm happy to share that with you. This is the Selection Committee's motivation. Migraine is one of the most common and disabling neurological conditions affecting humans. And the work of the four winners 
contributed to the clinically effective classification of the disorder and then to unraveling the key mechanisms relevant to its understanding, which have led on to a novel therapy and opened up possibilities for future ones. Uh, the work on migraine is a remarkable example of bedside to bench to bedside research, which has yielded tangible clinical benefit. Thank you, Professor Morrison. I was wondering if you could please give us an overview of the considerations in the selection committee to choose the winners for this year's Brain Prize. Well, as you've just heard, the Brain Prize for 2021 is awarded for fundamental pioneering work on migraine. An international group of four neuroscientists have discovered a key mechanism uh, that causes migraine, a, a condition affecting more than a billion people, um, which according to the World Health Organization is one of the most prevalent and disabling uh, of neurological diseases. Their research has paved the way to the development of an entirely new class of migraine-specific drugs called CGRP antagonists, which help to prevent migraine attacks in those who are affected. How does the selection committee actually find the winners? I guess it's not an easy task. Uh, not at all. Each year, the, the selection committee for the Brain Pies is, is faced with deciding amongst over a hundred nominations, uh, all of whom have done amazing biomedical science, uh, as to which one or which set of them is the most deserving for the prize that year. Uh, we read the nominations, uh, the scientific papers that the nominees have published, take up references on what we judge to be the best candidacies, and we meet on two separate occasions to discuss and then to decide. Now this year, of course, we had to do this virtually due to the travel restrictions. Um, but we know each other well, uh, so we're able to carry this out dispassionately as in every year before. Uh, yes, it's, it's difficult deciding on the winners. There's so many deserving candidates. And now, Professor Morris, I wonder if you could tell us more about the disease that the prize winners, Professors Edwinson, Goatsby, Moskowitz and Olesen, have been key to gaining an understanding of. Migraine is much more than a bad headache. It's a serious neurological disease with symptoms that include severe throbbing and, and recurring head pain, uh, nausea, um, vomiting, dizziness, extreme sensitivity to sound, light, uh, touch and even smell. And some migraine attacks can last for, for several days. In fact, many of us will know sufferers, perhaps in our own families, and, and, and understand their burden. In fact, more than four million people across the world suffer at least 15 migraine attacks per month. Now, for many, migraine severely diminishes the quality of their life, including the ability to work, and can lead to depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances. So the economic and social costs associated with migraine are also extremely high here in Denmark and across the world. So a severe disease indeed, but surely there have been treatments for migraine for some while. Yes, there have been, including some readily available drugs like uh, paracetamol, uh, but their efficacy is incomplete. Others are more powerful, but they can have significant side effects. And on top of that, their, their action tends to be against an existing attack that's already underway and may not prevent future ones. Uh, there was, therefore, a, an urgent need to develop new classes of migraine-specific drugs. Can you tell us a bit more about the prize winners and their scientific journeys? One of the characteristics of, of contemporary science is teamwork. We've seen that, all of us, during the last year. Uh, with the astonishingly fast development of vaccines, a, a task made possible by the rapid sequencing of the genome for COVID back in January of last year. But you have to know where to start. And the problem in migraine has always been, where do we start? Now, in this case, it's been a long adventure story, but one with a, a satisfying, if still incomplete, conclusion. One step was taken by Michael Moskowitz, a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, who was the first to suggest that substances known as neuropeptides may be involved. Some are released from trigeminal nerve fibers that innervate the thin membranes surrounding the brain, the meninges. 
and its associated uh, blood vessels. This is one of the only areas of the brain to monitor pain. And then? Well, the story then moves to Sweden, where a young Australian doctor, Peter Goadsby, had come to work specifically with Professor Lars Edvinson at Lund University. And they jointly identified a neuropeptide called calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP. And CGRP is released by trigeminal nerve fibers during a migraine attack, and it's, uh, one of its actions is to dilate cranial arteries. And so they therefore wondered if CGRP might be of central importance to migraine, as well as to cerebral blood flow. Now at this point, a Danish clinician, yes, Olesen, who's now a professor at the Rijks Hospitalet in Copenhagen, where, where the Danish headache center is located, he comes into the picture, asking the critical question, is CGRP release a cause or a consequence of migraine? Which is the chicken and, and, and which is the egg? And I take it that he found out that CGRP was the cause? Well, he got ethical permission to do a brave experiment with people to administer CGRP and see what happened. And his team found that doing so brought on a migraine. And later, that giving the drug which blocked the action of the receptor at which CGRP operated would prevent this from happening. But that wasn't quite the end of the story. Showing that something is definitively the case in science and medicine is, is, is a tall order. Uh, there were many more things to be done. Professor Ollison spent a great deal of time working with numerous doctors internationally to ratify the various different types of migraine and to create a diagnosis system uh, that would be accepted worldwide. And this has been really important for clinical trials. Uh, Peter Goadsby, who as we've seen, had traveled all the way from Australia to Sweden to take part in some of the, the early work with Lars Edvinson, is now a professor at King's College London, where he directs a laboratory and a clinical research facility. He and, and Professor Edvinson in Sweden have since worked extensively together on migraine and cluster headache uh, leading directly to new drugs called Gipants and CGRP monoclonal antibody treatments. They've um, explored migraine and cluster headache mechanisms in both laboratory models uh, and in human experimental medicine, um, while Dr. Goadsby also maintains an active clinical practice that focuses on creating real translational benefits for patients with headache disorders. So this is an example of a bench-to-bedside success? Yes, uh, that's right. It, it started at the bedside, moved to the lab, uh, and then has gone back and forth between fundamental and clinical research to define and refine the novel treatments. So like the work we described last year, brain science is not always very straightforward. You may have little idea what is going to unravel along the journey. That's right. Um, and in this case, working in four separate places gave us insights into what to look for. Uh, the finding of a possible target, seeing that's released during a migraine attack, establishing it having a causal role in the disorder by showing that blocking it or where this peptide acted in the brain prevented migraine uh, were all parts of this big jigsaw puzzle. Uh, this jigsaw puzzle of some importance given the sheer number of people affected by the condition across the world. Mm. It's a fascinating story, but are there any closing remarks that you as chairman of the selection committee would like to add to the amazing story of the Brain Prize 2021? Well, I, I think it's important to note that the research hasn't ended. Uh, the Lundbeck Foundation looks upon this still evolving scientific story uh, as another fine example of where basic science and careful experimentation are walking uh, hand in hand. So um, on behalf of all of the members of the selection committee, I offer my congratulations to professors Michael Moscovich, Lars Edvinson, Jess Ollison, and Peter Goadsby. Thank you very much, Professor Morris, and congratulations to you and the selection committee on finding these winners. Now, we would love to have had the winners here on stage, 
But due to COVID-19 restrictions, we had to interview them separately in different parts of the world. Professor Moskowitz, it seems that you somehow started it all, or at least triggered something really significant with your Lancet hypothesis in 1979 about migraine. It was clear that migraine lacked a coherent pathophysiology and effective treatment. The prevailing vascular hypothesis proposed that dilated blood vessels caused headache. The data just didn't support it. The Lancet hypothesis proposed that vessel dilation during headache was due to the action of vasodilating peptides. These peptides are released from sensory fibers surrounding blood vessels in the brain's capsule or meninges. The stimulation of these nerve fibers accompanied by neuropeptide release was what caused acute headaches. When we proposed the Lancet hypothesis, nothing was known about vasoactive peptides in meningeal sensory fibers. The formulation was based on meager evidence. Substance P was the only known vasoactive peptide in sensory fibers at that time. Other peptides like CGRP and PACAP were not discovered in the meninges for at least six more years. So the 40-year-old hypothesis emphasized that understanding this final common pathway for pain transmission and its released neuropeptides may suggest new strategies for treatment and prevention. It refocused the migraine field for the next four decades. How did you go about discovering the sensory innovation to the circle of Willis and its first vasoactive neuropeptide? To explore the Lancet hypothesis, my lab traced for the first time sensory fibers in the circle of Willis to the trigeminal ganglia. We followed this by identifying the first vasoactive peptide within this pathway, substance P. We anticipated the discovery of other neuropeptides because only a fraction of meningeal sensory fibers contained the peptide we were working with. Importantly, we showed that vasoactive peptide release from sensory fibers in meningeal tissues caused inflammation. We named this pathway the trigeminal vascular system. Using this knowledge, we provided a new mechanism of action for acute migraine drugs. We determined that the ergots and tryptans inhibited neuropeptide release, including CGRP, by acting on serotonin receptors on sensory fibers. Our findings also led to the discovery of a new serotonin-based anti-migraine treatment in the clinic. The trigeminal vascular roadmap now provides the site of action for more than 20 drugs in the clinic. It's among the few examples in neurology where drugs were developed by intent rather than by chance. What were the steps that led you to propose a headache triggering event within the brain causing migraine headache? And how good is the evidence? Although the trigeminal vascular system was important to migraine, lacking was an upstream trigger for pain. Cortical spreading depression or CSD provided the answer to part of that puzzle. CSD is an intense, slowly propagating wave of discharging neurons and glia that underlies migraine aura. Using high resolution imaging techniques, we found that brain changes during visual aura and CSD in animals were remarkably similar. We then made the following three observations about CSD that it could activate meningeal sensory fibers and contribute to pain. It caused meningeal inflammation that is blocked by anti-migraine drugs. It can be suppressed by drugs used in migraine prevention. Finally, bringing the research focus back to humans, we recently observed an inflammatory signal within the human meninges overlying the occipital cortex in uh, migraineurs with visual auras. The signal appears reminiscent of inflammation after cortical spreading depression in animals. It's yet another example of successful bench-to-bedside research in migraine. An impressive story, Professor Moskowitz. But I know it doesn't end there. Let us go on to Professor Peter Goatsby. Could you tell us a little about how you started to work on CGRP and your early influences? I was lured into headache research by my mentor, Jim Lance, in Sydney, and I was interested in the trigeminal nerve, the pain 
the pain nerve of the head, as it might be described. And I attended a meeting in southern Sweden in June of 1985. I listened to a simply brilliant lecture by a then young medic, physiologist and pharmacologist, Lars Edvinson, who talked about the trigeminal system and its protective effect on the brain, including the role of neuropeptides. I was taken by this. I, I thought there was something that would have, that could be related to headache in what he was discussing. I approached him, he was very gracious. We sat down, we talked for some time and designed a series of experiments to test our models, our experimental models in humans to get bench to bedside to bench to bedside, translational validation of where we were headed to understand if these newly described neuropeptides could have a role in headache disorders and if there was a role in headache disorders, which one was the most important one. We came to CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide, as being important in both migraine and cluster headache. And this turns out to be certainly the case. Tell us more about how you have worked with your colleague, Lars Edvinson. We've collaborated looking at other neuropeptides, pituitary adenylate cyclase activating polypeptide, the helidermins and helispectins, trying to understand the physiology and pharmacology, the background to how these transmitters can change the central nervous system, change the cerebral blood flow, change the circulation, and be harnessed to understand primary headache disorders. How important is this work to you? It's been my career aim to make the world a better place for people with headache disorders. It's a privilege to be able to apply scientific principles and approaches to understand disorders that are, generally speaking, have been ignored. And to improve the lives in that way of many, many patients who were disabled by these dreadful conditions. Development of these medicines has been a privilege and an honour. And I'd be happy, I'm very happy to have been part of it. Thank you, Peter Goatsby. The story now travels from Australia to Sweden and Denmark. Let us hear from Professor Lars Edvinson. When did you consider CGRP important for migraine pathophysiology? Well, I had been a frequent guest at Migraine Trust conferences in London over many years and had begun thinking of migraine pathophysiology and if my work could fit in. When we found and described CGRP in the trigeminovascular system 1984 and uncovered its role in regulation of cranial vasculature, I thought it was a distinct possibility. The invitation to write a review in Trends in Neuroscience 1985 came very handy and I did put forward my thoughts and described the connection and the hypothesis. When did you actually feel you had proven a role of CGRP in migraine? Well, it was very clear to me that following the collaboration work with Peter Goldsby on patients with migraine and other primary headaches that CGRP was a key player. In acute attacks, we only observed that CGRP was released into the jugular venous blood in patients suffering migraine attacks. No other neuropeptide had such a strong correlation. It was also underpinned by the effect of triptans. Sumatriptan acutely not only removed the pain in the migraine attack, but at the same time, CGRP was normalized. When were you sure it would help blocking CGRP in patients and result in meaningful relief? Well, it took many years to translate our findings to meaningful medication. One hurdle was the unique structure and function of the CGRP receptor. It turned out to be a type B of G-protein coupled receptors, coupled to ramp 1 to make a functional receptor. After this observation, industry succeeded in producing a series of CGRP receptor blockers, which during the time period 2001 to 2009 were studied and shown to be effective medications. During the last decade, the GPENs have been modified in order to be without side effects. We have now, in addition, a number of monoclonal antibodies directed towards CGRP or the CGRP receptor for migraine prophylaxis. 
But what really matters is that patients are relieved of the pain. So I will have to deal with all the mails I get from grateful patients all over the world. Thank you. That's really touching. And last, but certainly not least, Professor Jess Olesen, is there a reliable way of diagnosing migraine? Yes, there is, but it was not possible before 1988. Uh, at that time, we published the first international classification of headache disorders as a result of several years of extensive committee work. It included uh, so-called explicit or unambiguous diagnostic criteria for more than a hundred different kinds of headache. For migraine, these diagnostic criteria have remained unaltered through three editions of the classification, and they are used all over the world. They have been shown to be highly reliable, reproducible, and have greatly facilitated migraine research. Can you describe the finding that made you believe that the mystery of migraine can be solved? Uh, it was actually believed to be almost a black box, impossible to penetrate. But as a young doctor, when I had become an expert in brain blood flow measurement in human beings uh, during my doctoral thesis, uh, we studied migraine patients and saw that the procedure itself triggered a migraine attack. Therefore, we could follow measurement after measurement during the migraine attack, what exactly happened, and it was completely similar to an animal experimental phenomenon called cortical spreading depression. Those uh, measurements put an end to the prevailing ischemic theory of migraine, which said that migraine is caused by a spasm of the uh, constriction of the arteries to the brain and insufficient blood flow to the brain. That theory was dead and instead replaced by the cortical spreading depression theory. How were you able to study the importance of signaling molecules in migraine? The problem with migraine is that it occurs in attacks and it's unpredictable. So therefore, we thought of provoking attacks and attacks are really very unpleasant and painful but they do not hurt the organism in any way, so this would be ethically completely permissible. So we developed this human model where we deliberately gave uh, naturally occurring substances that we thought would induce a migraine attack and uh, showed if they could or could not do, uh, induce the attack. So using this model, we identified several signaling molecules that can actually cause a migraine attack. What was the role of the model in the development of therapies targeting CGRP or its receptor? Well, I knew from the work of my colleagues Edwinson and Goldsby and others that CGRP was an interesting molecule. And I used it to uh, provoke migraine in the model that I just mentioned. So when we gave CGRP into a blood vessel in the arm, it could induce a migraine attack. I followed this up and showed that if we block the effect of CGRP, it was safe to do that. And finally, uh, I headed the first drug trial in patients showing that a compound that blocked the CGRP receptor was effective in migraine attacks. And thus we proved the principle of CGRP antagonism for migraine. Thank you to Professors Edvinson, Goatsby, Moskowitz and Olesen for this inspiring glimpse of the frontiers in a very special field of brain science. On behalf of the Lundbeck Foundation, I congratulate you once again on your achievements and this year's Brain Prize. Hopefully we will be able to hand over the prize in person this autumn and celebrate you physically, just as we hope to have all of you with us here in Copenhagen next year. Until then, thank you all.